Hi, welcome members. Um, this is our first ever virtual edition of Coffee with the Curator. I'm Bethany Sims, the Member Relations Manager here at the museum. We're excited to try out this new format and we appreciate you all experimenting with us. We have over 50 households signed in, so thank you all again for joining. Um, we hope some of you are enjoying Chef Laura's white chocolate raspberry muffins that we um, sent the recipe along with the invitation. A few quick notes on how the program will go this morning. You'll notice that there are two icons on your screen. Uh, there's an icon called chat that you can use to ask technical questions um, to the panelists. For example, if you have an issue with sound or seeing everything that's going on, please use the chat box. Uh, there's also a Q&A icon. And this is where um, you can type in submission or questions throughout today's presentation through the Q&A window. And we're saving time at the end of the presentation to answer questions that come in. Uh, so anything about Danny's presentation or the exhibition that you, you want to know, put them in there. Um, and then we'll be sending out a follow-up email after today's program. Please feel free to share any comments or suggestions. We would love to hear how this format worked for you and if there are ways for us to improve for next time. So um, now I would like to introduce our Executive Director and CEO, Nanette Macy-Jones. Okay, am I there? I am hoping I'm there. You're there, Nanette. <laughs> I am there, okay, I just can't see me. That's fine, I don't mind not seeing me. Um, so welcome everyone. As Bethany said, this is our first attempt at a live program for the membership and no group better to start with than our Ambassador Circles members. Uh, and so I wanted to, 50 households, that's pretty good. We're, so we're really thrilled. Um, I want to thank you all for being members of the museum. This is incredibly important all the time, but it's really important now. We need you. Uh, so please stay with us as members. Please go and look at all the wonderful online things that we're offering so that people can stay connected to the museum. The other thing people have been asking me is how else they can help. So in truth, the very first thing you do, stay connected. The second thing is please stay a member at your membership level. We love our Ambassador Circle members. And the third thing, yes, we could use money. And if you have additional money to donate, yes, we would love it because we are under a lot of financial stress. This is true of everyone throughout the community and we know that. So we, my first thought is for you to be generous to everyone that means something to you because this is a tough time for all of us in human services, in culture. So please be generous if you can. Now for the program. So Daniel Marcus is going to lead us through a great uh, experience with the Stonewall exhibition. Uh, Danny is how he's known inside the museum. Danny is our first Roy Lichtenstein Fellow. The Roy Lichtenstein Foundation gave uh, us money, a, a six-year grant, for us to have young museum professionals uh, be on our staff for a two-year um, uh, fellowship uh, what, windows or fellowship uh, periods. And while Danny's been here, he's been an incredible asset to us. I, I can't say enough great things about Danny. Uh, some of you may have known, uh, seen his installation of Art in the Vietnam Era, which was all from the collection. It was looking at the collection in a new way, which I thought was absolutely great. It was in the upper level of the Walter Wing at the part that staff tends to call the tip, the piece that looks out over uh, the Feely sculpture. Uh, but one of the things that he did that was most important during his fellowship was help us bring Stonewall home. Art After Stonewall is a project that dates, it's at least a dozen years old. We've been working on it for a very long time. We had a great guest curator in Jonathan Weinberg, but we've had a series of inside curators, internal curators that help us implement an exhibition. And it's so important uh, to be the last curator in that line who brings it over you know, successfully and installs the show and launches that show. And Danny was that person. He also worked tirelessly on the exhibition book, which just won a big award. So we're really proud of that. Uh, won a curator's award for um, outstanding a national award. So we're really proud of that. So without further ado, Danny, I'll be quiet and listen to you. Do 
Okay, I'm unmuted and I'm starting my video. So thank you so much for that warm introduction, Nanette, and hi to everyone out there. Um, thank you all for participating in this experiment. Um, let me load up my presentation here. So let me just say a little bit about what's going to happen here. Um, and, and I'll try to take you through my portion of things reasonably quickly. In fact, let me set a stopwatch here. Um, so, you know, um, Coffee with a Curator is usually meant as a kind of intimate behind the scenes look at um, an exhibition that's on view in the galleries. But of course we have the, um, this sort of unfortunate situation where we can't actually get into the galleries. Um, and uh, so I'm going to give a kind of guided tour of the exhibition. I will try to keep this um, quick. It's a massive show, so um, I, it, it'll be a bit of a labor on my part uh, to make this work. Um, and I'm also gonna try to keep the chat visible as much as I can in case there are problems with my slideshow. Um, and I'm um, more than happy to answer any questions you might have about any aspect of the show. So you can take us off the topics that I present um, uh, into any realm of the experience of the show, its gestation. I'm more than happy to um, try to answer questions as best I can. One thing I'll say is that, um, so this is, you know, coffee with the curator, but I, but I, am, I am but a curator. Um, I uh, am part of a team of four curators who uh, ultimately made this show happen. And I have to give credit where it's due. Jonathan Weinberg um, is, is really the originator um, of the exhibition. He's, uh, you know, been the through line um, and um, it was just a total pleasure working with him um, and with Drew Sawyer, who's now at the Brooklyn Museum and of course, Tyler Can. Um, it, at CMA. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak from my perspective. Um, I'm sure if any of the other three curators were to do this, you would get a very different um, experience. So um, the other thing I'll say is that it's just slightly heartbreaking for me to share these photos. Um, you know, I, I took the slides that you're going to see here, the, the photographs, um, the last day that we could get into the building and just ran around the exhibition and tried to document it as best I could. Um, and it just really breaks my heart that the show is in Columbus right now and none of us can see it in person. Um, I don't know what to do with that feeling. Um, I, I, it's something I really dwell with, um, but um, you know, it, it will be slightly emotional for me to take us through these slides. I, I already know that. Um, so let me just get started. We're, um, we're looking here at the entrance to the exhibition. Um, putting this show together in Columbus was in some ways a unique um, opportunity, but also a unique challenge. We had um, already installed the show in New York at two separate venues, um, the Leslie Lohman Museum and the Gray Art Gallery. And then we brought the show to uh, Miami, um, uh, all in advance of having it come to Columbus, even though it is, of course, a Columbus originated show. Um, in New York, the exhibition was split between two venues. And so it kind of had a, um, a natural two part um, look and feel, if you will. In fact, I've talked to people who only saw half of the show, but tell me that they saw the whole thing. And I have to tell them, oh, there was, there was another half. Um, it, it broke down roughly chronologically so that the 1970s um, were at Leslie Lohman and the 1980s were at Gray Art Gallery. It's a two decade span that the show covers. So that, that does sort of make a bit of sense. Um, in Miami as well, the show was sort of divided between two very different spaces at the Frost Museum. So it's really only in Columbus that we were able to run the show continuously. And that had always been the ambition um, that that was um, how we first envisioned the exhibition. Um, however, we didn't really, I think, 
um, think through just how the building itself would um, either abet us, but also resist us in certain ways. Again, 1969 to 1989, that's a, that is very much a, a chronological trajectory. We move forward in time. And yet, if you've spent time in the, the lower level Walter Wing, you know it's kind of like a choose your own adventure space. There is a kind of linearity to the exhibition, but it, um, it, it doesn't necessarily read that way. Um, and so what you're looking at here is a photograph of the, what I think of as sort of the proper way to go, um, which would be to you know, begin with the title wall um, and then move to the right. But you know that there are two galleries, actually two galleries plus, um, to your left. So um, I'll speak to some of the ways that that makes trouble for the chronological flow. Ultimately, I think it works for the show, but um, it was something we were thinking about a lot when we were putting this together. Um, so Art After Stonewall, just to give you a little synopsis, I mean, it's an exhibition that, um, you know, traces two decades worth of interactions between queer culture and politics, um, you know, the politics of gay liberation and the art world. And it does this um, by looking very broadly at what a whole range of artists were doing to engage the, the gay liberation movement, um, many of whom, you know, the vast majority in the show um, identified as, as gay or lesbian or trans, um, but um, some of whom are straight. So it's not a, an 100%, you know, uh, queer show. Um, the idea here is to take this crucial period, both in the history of our culture and the history of art, um, and to rethink it, um, to, to find works of art that might not have resonated um, in immediately, um, might not have read as having anything to do with um, gay, gay liberation, and to kind of retell this story with um, the, the movement for liberation, um, again, as a, a kind of centering device and as a through line. Um, so that's the large ambition of the show. Um, the, the argument is that, you know, in particular, the, the Stonewall um, uprising in, in June of 1969, it has a special um, place and resonance in the history of queer culture and politics. It's not the absolute origin moment for, um, you know, gay and lesbians organizing themselves um, politically, um, but it marks a, a, a shift in the politics um, and a, the birth of a new strategy. And it's, of course, the strategy of, um, of coming out, of publicly declaring um, one's identity um, to a, you know, still largely homophobic world in, in 1969. And so that, that um, gesture of coming out, you know, marching in the streets, um, you know, making banners, posters, placards, um, organizing politically in overt and open ways, um, living as an out person, um, all of that is central to the, the show. It is really what it, it's the story that it tells. Um, but there is no one way of coming out. So in that sense, it's sort of a, um, a, an exploration of the myriad ways that artists and queer people, um, you know, came out um, uh, without, again, kind of prescribing a, a particular um, form for doing that. No one, no one had a script, if you like. Um, the exhibition is organized um, into different sections. The first work that you see um, is a photo of the stone wall in the, the site of the riots um, in 1969. Um, it's still there, although the bar has moved a couple doors down, but people sort of overlook that fact. Um, this is just looking to the left. So again, there is sort of a traffic flow issue with the, the show. The first of the seven sections in the exhibition is called Coming Out, and that is directly behind us. Um, but you're looking here um, toward a section called Sexual Outlaws. Um, so again, it's a chronological-ish exhibition, um, but there are different paths that you could take um, through the history. Um, of course, there's this object that we're looking at um, right in front of us. Um, 
and have been looking at for a little while. Let's see if I can get another view of that. Um, there are two things to, to mention here. Um, these are both some of the most special artworks in the show, um, uh, especially the, the um, granite sculpture that is in the foreground here. Um, this is a piece of furniture by the artist Scott Burton. It's called Two Part Chair. Um, I think we got it on loan from the Albright Knox Museum, where it actually sits outdoors and I believe can be sat on. We do not let people sit on it. Um, but, um, you know, Burton's story is so, um, you know, it, it's really in, in a way typical of so many of the stories in the exhibition. Um, Burton was um, best known as a kind of minimalist sculptor. He made public artworks um, uh, in, the, in the 70s. Um, into the 1980s. Um, he made this particular um, work, which is both sculpture and public art, um, in 1986, the year that he had his first big museum retrospective. And um, it was a year in which his own struggle with um, AIDS really took a turn for, for the worse. Um, he knew that he had to, in some way, make his experience as a gay man um, part of his art. It had not really been uh, up to that point or not had had not been, I should say, a central um, public facing aspect of his work. And um, so this project, two part chair, um, you know, is a, his sort of way of um, working his own um, experience and especially a memory at this point of um, of gay sex, of gay sexuality um, that was, you know, under threat um, of eradication from AIDS, um, of working all of that into his art. So I think it really sums up the, the show's large argument that, you know, you can't really hold the history of art apart from the history of, you know, um, queer culture, queer experience. Um, the work in the back of this room is, um, by Robert Gober, um, and it is his untitled closet. It's an, it's an open closet, it doesn't have a door. So I think you can see with my pointer, that's the, that's the closet. It's meant to just sort of blend into the architecture. Um, uh, we would be very happy if, if you sort of didn't notice it at first and then uh, realized at a certain point that that's not a closet that's usually in this space. Um, uh, Gober is sort of notorious for making objects that make you look twice. Um, and that gesture of looking twice, I think, makes sense here because we, we want viewers to be confronted at the very beginning of the exhibition, both with a, a closet um, and with the, the kind of ongoing um, experience and legacy of, of homophobia, um, but also with a closet, you know, that again, has no door, it's, it's opened up, there's nothing in it. Um, it's, I think, a, a, just an extraordinarily kind of poetic work. Um, and these, these two objects, I mean, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about how this pairing was going to work and how these things were going to go together. Um, and also thinking about whether the floor could actually support the like 1600 pounds worth of granite that you're looking at right there. So I'll try to move a little more quickly here. I, I know we're, uh, we don't have infinite time. Um, again, there are seven sections to the exhibition and we begin with, um, with coming out. The works in this section um, really speak to the immediate impact of um, Stonewall as, as a, a, a game changer in queer culture and politics. Um, this is a photograph of, um, you know, some of the participants in the riots. Um, the, you know, we talk about the Stonewall riot or the Stonewall uprising or the Stonewall riots, Stonewall Rebellion. Um, these are protests um, against police harassment that just, you know, they sort of exploded out of um, a, a, a late night at the Stonewall Inn, a, um, a, a gay bar in uh, Greenwich Village in New York City. Um, but the riots really kind of, they took on a life of their own, um, spilling over into the streets over several days and nights. This photo wasn't taken on the first night of rioting. Um, it would have been taken a couple of days later. Um, and again, this is, this is just a, a, a turning point in um, the history of um, queer um, liberation. The, um, you know, the act of commemorating the riots really is sort of 
almost as important as the riots themselves or the uprising um, itself. Um, the, I wanna make sure, is my audio still on? Um, Nanette just popped up. Um, I'm gonna assume my audio is still on, but tell me in the chat if, if okay, um, great. So uh, the, the act of commemorating the riots is really as significant as the riots themselves. Um, the sculpture that you're looking at in this case here um, is by the artist Tommy Lanigan Schmidt, who was happened to be at Stonewall the night of the first um, protest uh, demonstration, and um, he, you know, immediately set about to commemorate the event um, with a um, this little tinsel um, and aluminum foil sculpture, um, which he calls an allegory of the Stonewall riot. Um, but um, you know, the there were so many ways in which. Um, the you know Stonewall um, as a as a kind of rallying cry um, was was amplified over the course of you know the year 1969 to 1970 and probably most famously you know it is the the organization of um, uh, gay and lesbian activist groups um, like the Gay Liberation Front that really changes the the, the game in a way um, these are groups that um, you know rather than than organize sort of what, what we call homophile um, societies. So, you know, groups that are meant to provide a space of sociability for um, gay and lesbian men and women, but which are largely sort of inward focused and private, um, you know, Gay Liberation Front was, it, it just took its, its, um, its model of organizing from the anti-war movement and from the civil rights movement, especially, um, and organized um, public marches um, and protests in the street. Um, and, you know, this pair of works um, at the center of the screen, um, it, it looks like this is a document of one of those protests. Actually, this is a propaganda image meant to, you know, uh, uh, drum up participation in the movement, come out, you know, come out as, a, as a, an out um, gay or lesbian person, but also come out into the streets, you know, um, out, of, out of the, you know, out of the buildings and into the streets. Um, so much of the work in coming out kind of straddles that line between movement propaganda or ephemera and, uh, and fine art. Um, it's a hierarchy that we don't really try to put back in order in the exhibition. There are a lot of moments where what you're looking at on the wall is something made by an artist, but made for a political purpose. Um, but of course, many of the works in coming out in this section of the exhibition um, really just are a, a sort of document um, of the, um, the sea change in everyday life for, um, for queer people after Stonewall. Um, I think of this photograph by Crawford Barton, um, which you know, depicts a pair of lovers kissing in the Castro um, neighborhood in San Francisco in the late 70s. This is also taken in the late 70s. Um, a photograph of a, um, a lesbian couple, um, uh, photographed by Jeb, um, Joan E. Byron, um, a, um, just one of the foremost um, chroniclers of the um, lesbian movement in the United States, um, who just, she crisscrossed the country taking photographs of, um, uh, of lesbian women in an attempt to, to build an iconography, um, to build a body of images um, so that um, women could see each other um, in ways that they hadn't um, before. So I'm just walking you through um, the first gallery here. I should say there, it, there is a chance that my cat will try to mess with me at some point in this process. So um, if that happens, just like bear, bear with me. Um, one, one thing to say kind of as a, as a matter of um, behind the scenes, um, uh, a kind of behind the scenes thing. Um, it's hard curatorially to negotiate an exhibition that isn't all mostly the same medium. Um, and Stonewall really isn't all the same medium. There's a lot of photography, there's a lot of painting, there's sculpture, um, there are lots of different kinds of works on paper. Um, maybe we can talk a bit about this in the Q and A, but this was difficult to try to take a gallery that had such different kind of work 
um, and, um, and constrain it into an order so that it would look kind of natural um, to have, uh, you know, a painting, a big painting of, you know, three gay cowboys out west um, uh, with two photographs from protests, um, you know, in, in Los Angeles. And so something we thought a lot about is how, how do you pair works with each other, um, especially when they, they are not of the same medium. Um, the exhibition has heroes in a way. Um, one of those heroes is certainly um, Marsha P. Johnson, uh, uh, just a, an indefatigable organizer, um, founder with Sylvia Rivera of um, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, a, um, a group that organized and advocated for trans rights um, in the, the immediate aftermath of Stonewall. Um, Johnson and Rivera were also part of Gay Liberation Front. Um, this space kind of pays homage to, to Johnson um, and, and you know, her presence is felt throughout the exhibition in various ways. Okay, I'm gonna speed this up just a little bit because uh, I have to. So coming out is a, is a central part of the exhibition. Um, the, the section spills over into the next gallery. Um, and um, uh, here we're sort of thinking about the, the way that the original kind of nucleus of the, um, the gay liberation movement as it was known in 1969 and 1970, the way that that nucleus started to sort of not, not so much splinter, um, but produce offshoots, um, one of which was, was the, um, you know, this flowering of um, organizations, um, uh, you know, by and for women under the banner both of gay liberation and women's liberation. Um, so in, in this gallery, we're looking more at some of the work that was produced um, in the context of um, uh, women forming their own organizations. Um, and this quartet of, um, of works on paper um, by Louise Fishman um, all speaks to her and emerges out of her experience as part of a consciousness raising group um, and, and uh, uh, celebrates some of the um, the names of her fellow um, uh, agitators and comrades, Ty Grace Atkinson, Jill Johnson, um, and Esther Newton, and Angry Louise is um, at the top left. So um, Stonewall is by its nature something of an unruly exhibition. I said that there are seven sections, but the sections kind of bleed into each other um, in ways that are perhaps unavoidable. Um, and so in this gallery, there still are a number of works from um, coming out, including this just this amazing uh, motorcycle uh, outfit. This is actually not a work really by an artist, um, but it's uh, something just extraordinary and it speaks to the, you know, the creative sort of DIY culture that was part of queer activism um, after Stonewall. Um, okay, here we go. Um, but also in this gallery, um, uh, we begin a, a section of the show called Gender Play. Um, gender Play really is about, you know, it's both about the, the politics of gender, which were central to, um, to queer, activism, queer theory in the, in the 1970s. Um, but here we're really looking and thinking about the subversion of gender. Um, and this speaks inevitably to um, the present moment, I think, um, in which the subversion of gender is still um, uh, such a large public issue and question. Um, this section kind of begins with a, um, a, a paper doll set. Um, uh, the, the paper dolls here kind of map the various options, um, the sartorial options for an out lesbian in the, the late 70s. Um, uh, but more to the point, I think, suggests that gender itself is um, something that can be manipulated um, through um, performance, through um, costume, through gesture. Um, and that idea is very central to this part of the exhibition. Um, 
at the center of it is the, you know, the, the a body of work um, relating to the Coquettes, a, a performance group on the West Coast. Um, these are puppets made by um, Charles Ludlam um, on the East Coast. Um, an incredible painting by David Hockney of the drag performer Divine, and you know, you, many of you will know him from um, John Waters. Um, and um, a, uh, a selection of works here. Yeah, these are, um, these are great. These are photographs by Hal Fisher. And these two, I think, really speak to the theme of the show, of, of this section, um, gender play. The, the photographs kind of purport to give an anthropological view of um, gay um, culture in, in the Bay Area. So they're mapping the different ways that it, you can, uh, kind of not really covertly um, but uh, in, a, in a coded way um, let people know what your sexual preferences are putting a handkerchief in the right pocket or the left pocket um, but um, for our purposes you know the, the idea here is as much that one could radically change one's gendered identity simply by you know um, something as uh, you know a gesture as small as uh, you know, um, putting your keys on a loop, um, that, that gender is is malleable in a certain way. Okay, I said that there is a traffic flow to the exhibition. Um, I, I, I'm going to solve that problem in a way by taking you back to the start of the show, um, and then we'll look at sexual outlaws, um, and then we'll go back to the end of gender play. And I know it's it's. In real life, this would be hard to do. Um, I think, you know, Stonewall is a show that rewards multiple visits, and this is kind of one of the reasons why. So, um, you know, so much of uh, the show is about, you know, um, marching in the street and uh, coming out in a very public and positive way um, uh, with a big smile on one's face. Um, Sexual Outlaws is sort of the, it's like, it's not the the mere opposite of that impulse, uh, but it certainly kind of um, speaks to the more inward focused um, uh, and, um, you know, in some ways darker side um, of the um, explosion of, you know, um, queer sexuality in the 1970s. Darker, not in a bad way, um, but just, you know, more underground. Um, Sexual Outlaws is um, largely about, um, S and M, uh, S and M sexuality, um, but but not entirely. Um, so at the left here is a mask. This is actually in CMA's collection. It's part of the Schiller collection. Um, this is by Nancy Grossman, um, whose work she would sort of chop up um, leather motor uh, motorbike jackets and um, and sew them onto wooden head molds that she had created um, to create these sort of slightly fearsome personages um, as having to do with s and um, mainly because the materials were all of the materials of leather culture. Um, so, I mean, leather chains um, and studs and all of that. Um, but she, claims not to have been aware of s &M. She saw this as an expression of her own sort of inner sense of self. Um, and it's just an extraordinarily powerful um, uh, work. Um, this section also gives um, a view into the um, activities of lesbian artists who separated themselves from their male colleagues um, and formed communes, um, especially on the West Coast. Um, uh, both to experiment um, as artists, but also to experiment with new forms of social and sexual um, organization. Um, see some of that work, some of the work born of that um, experiment is here. Um, these are a trio of photographs by um, Morgan Gwenwald, a um, photographer who should be better known. Um, one, one thing that we're trying to do with this show is of course, bring out work by um, artists who really haven't got their due. Um, you'll see here that so um, sexual outlaws bleeds into a section called um, uses of the erotic. That title um, comes from uh, an essay by Audre Lorde, the poet and um, a lesbian theorist activist. 
Um, the idea here is to think about eroticism as a, um, as a sort of force of creativity, um, as many artists in the 70s and 80s um, thought of it. Um, and so the works um, on view here, um, are none of them are sort of um, straightforwardly pornographic, but many of them do um, contain at their core images of, you know, sexual union or sexual um, uh, uh, action activity. Um, this is a, a photograph by T. Corinne. Um, she would make these works um, by um, solarizing photographs and then multiplying them and folding them. Um, so, you know, it's sort of the gambit here is to take an image of sex, but then abstract it um, or, or make it um, a formal device just to see if that's possible. Um, we um, also have in this section of the exhibition um, an extraordinary sculpture by Harmony Hammond. Um, uh, I'll give you a detail of this work. Um, this is a beast. Um, it, the crate for this thing is massive. Um, it's impossible to move around. Um, and yet it's one of the most sort of vibrant, vital, animate uh, works in the show. Um, really a gorgeous thing. I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm being more sluggish than I should be. Um, so let me, let me speed up here um, in a somewhat dramatic uh, way, and then we'll, um, we'll go to Q&A uh, as, as, as soon as we can. Um, my, my timer just went off. So um, I'm gonna move us forward. I'll sort of take you through this section of the show. Um, I won't have time to comment too much other than to say that this is, these are some of my favorite things in the, the exhibition. They're cookie dough sculptures by the artist Nancy Freed. Um, totally wonderful, amazing that they survive. Who knew that cookie dough could stand the test of time? Okay. Um, I will say quickly that one thing that we, if I have, you know, sort of a list of things that I wish we had done better, one of those things would be to really give some geographic signposting to visitors. Um, this gallery um, here is devoted almost entirely to the West Side piers, um, which were famously a site of gay cruising and, and just sort of socializing in the, in the 1970s and sort of still to some extent. I mean, the piers themselves are gone, but the, that part of Greenwich Village remains um, you know, on the map of gay culture in New York City. Many, many artists went to the piers to do various kinds of projects. Um, the sculptor Gordon Mattaclark um, made these sort of architectural scale cuts into warehouses down on the piers. Um, and photographers flocked to the piers to, to photograph the, the sort of world of out open air um, gay sexuality and sociability. Um, you're looking at a photograph here by Shelley Seacombe um, documenting the, the life of the piers. So the piers, that is sort of the through line to this, ex, this part of the exhibition. Just giving you here a close up of this um, totally sumptuous, tiny self portrait um, by Alvin Baltrop, um, another photographer who not just, he didn't just work. Um, photographing the piers. He also lived in a van, like on the piers. Um, and this is a photograph by Andreas Sturzing, also documenting, you know, the life of the piers. This is the artist David Wanarowicz um, with Mike Bidlow. Um, and um, David Wanarowicz is one of the, the kind of key voices in this exhibition. We'll come to his work at the very end of the, the tour. This is a sculpture by Louise Bourgeois, um, who is not gay, lesbian identified, um, but nevertheless had a wicked sense of humor. Um, here she is wearing the sculpture. Um, it's sort of a, a um, it looks like, I don't know, rotting, rotting grapes, a rotting avocado, something like that. It's sort of meant to be both a collection of eggs and breasts and sort of testicular objects. It's it's a weird thing to wear on the streets of Greenwich Village. Um, one of my favorite things in the show. Okay, we're back on the, uh, on the other side of the building, um, back in um, 
you know, gender play coming out. Um, and now we've moved forward um, both in the exhibition, but also in time. So there, there is a kind of informal hinge in the exhibition where we go from the 1970s to the 1980s. I mean, we don't try to signpost that in an especially, you know, overt way. Um, but nevertheless, it is sort of a passage out of the, the, um, the politics of the 70s and into a different political moment. Um, so for many younger artists who kind of came up um, in and through the, the moment of, you know, 1970s gay liberation or women's liberation, um, you know, in forming themselves as a generation, their kind of, their impulse was to reject and to, in some ways, even refuse the, the codes, the signifiers, the, the symbols of, um, you know, um, gay and lesbian identity and politics. So, you know, for um, the, the generation identified, for example, like Keith Haring um, in downtown New York, um, you know, the idea was like, if you wanted to be part of Herring's, you know, circle of artists, shave the mustache, because if you, if you had a beard and a mustache, like you were not part of the youth, you were also like, you know, there's no way that you had anything to do with drag. Um, this, this newer generation, younger generation, I should say, really organized itself around an idea of gender fluidity and a kind of open welcoming um, politics. It wasn't about, you know, you are either gay, in which case you go and organize with gay men, or you're lesbian, in which case you explore the politics of lesbian separatism. It was about, you know, a, again, a much more kind of fluid and open um, notion of community um, really gathered around the word queer. Um, and so, uh, you know, these are artists who identify as queer in some ways more than they identify as gay or lesbian, um, or at least the word queer kind of summed up an ambition to have a more open um, community. Um, in, in a way, the, I said there are heroes in the exhibition and, and one of the heroes in this gallery is Andy Warhol, who really, you know, he was sort of the quintessentially queer artist. He, um, he kind of remained, his sexuality remained kind of an ambiguous question mark in certain ways, although he was, um, he was gay and, um, you know, had, had a, a, a very active interest in um, gay sexuality. Nevertheless, he organized around himself a very, you know, fluid world of um, artists and performers. Um, here's a, a photograph of Warhol in drag. Um, Warhol wasn't a drag performer, so this is sort of a misleading photograph, but it does, um, it does sort of cue us into, you know, the, the, the kind of expanded and more fluid codes um, uh, that kind of uh, operated in this world of culture um, where many of the artists were drag performers. Um, it's a pair of works. Um, this is Keith Haring photographed by Annie Leibovitz and this is the dancer Bill T. Jones body painted by Keith Haring and photographed by Tseng Kwang Chi. Um, this part of the exhibition also has a lot to do with performance, in part because many of the artists were performers, but also because performance spaces um, in New York City, much more than art galleries or museums, gave a, a place to queer artists, um, you know, to be out um, and to address their, their audience. Um, uh, you know, the art world is just still really homophobic during this period, um, uh, to, you know, in the 1980s. Um, and so, you know, per, the world of performance is a, is a refuge in so many ways. Here's just one of the photographs in this section. Um, this documents a performance, I think, at Wow Cafe in downtown New York. Um, maybe I'll come back to these things if you have questions. Um, they, they're, this is a, um, just a lovely sculpture by Arch Connolly um, and a painting. Um, by the artist duo um, McDermott and McGuff. Um, they are definitely a protagonists in the story of downtown queer New York. Um, I can come back to this as well. This is an audio um, listening station. 
but I want to um, want to get to this section of the show. Um, this sort of feels like especially relevant given the current COVID nineteen crisis, um, uh, in part just because the AIDS crisis um, also you know was a, a crisis organized around a viral infection. Um, what I think is so striking is that you know. Um, AIDS activists um, really like drew on the memory and the living legacy of Stonewall and the, the liberation movements, the street politics, if you like, you know, of the 1970s in organizing in the, especially in the late 1980s, um, the group ACT UP, um, a um, now sort of legendary um, part of the story of AIDS activism formed in 1987 um, really explicitly drawing on, um, you know, the memory of Stonewall riots and marching in the streets. Um, and um, many artists flocked to ACT UP, um, as, but not so much as artists, um, but rather as designers of propaganda, um, beginning with the Silence Equals Death poster, um, which was brandished at, at rallies and protests. Um, here you see it brandished. Um, but also other um, other works of propaganda that were all aimed at, um, you know, both um, attracting public attention to the AIDS crisis, but really, you know, forcing the government to invest in um, research um, and the testing, the rapid testing of drugs um, to to um, you know to treat AIDS. Um, and I mean, it's striking that like. If you read back through the, the kind of archives, the annals of ACT UP, um, you know, they really, they, they saw like even testing as a, um, a kind of problematic half measure. Um, they wanted AIDS cured. Um, they wanted, you know, drugs into bodies was the, was the, um, the mantra of ACT UP. And they, they didn't back down. I mean, one bit, um, the poster, uh, left here, the government has blood on its hands. Um, this was made to be deployed at a um, a rally, a protest called uh, "Seize Control of the FDA," where you know ACT UP activists went to the FDA um, and confronted you know public policy bureaucrats and um, put their bodies on the line. And it really changed the um, the story, um, the the history of. Um, uh, of the, the disease. It's at that moment, actually, um, after the FDA protest that um, Tony Fauci, who is now, you know, in the headlines around COVID, that he really started to take the demands of AIDS activists seriously and, it, and um, brought them into policymaking around AIDS. So, you know, this is a, an essential part of the exhibition. We didn't want to end with AIDS in part because we didn't want to end, um, we didn't want to give the impression that the history that we're thinking about, you know, literally expires um, in, in the late 1980s, um, in 1989. Um, and so we wanted to end on a, on a more upbeat note. Um, and I'll, I'll take you to the last part of the exhibition in just a second. That last part is called We're Here. And it's actually upstairs. It's um, the exhibition, you know, it's like there are more than, probably in Columbus, more than 250 works. So there's no way we could have fit it all downstairs. Um, it's funny, th this whole thing about the sections bleeding into one another, this is still part of the previous section of the show called Things Are Queer. Um, and um, this is a pair of just amazing um, dolls by um, the artist Greer Langton, who is sort of the hero of, of this part of the show. Um, maybe we can speak a bit about that in the Q&A. Um, just one of the most amazing things in the exhibition. Okay. So um, just before coming to the very last bit of, of the show, um, I want to give it a bit of a plug to a, um, a Columbus artist who um, is really important for this part of the exhibition. So what you're, you've been looking at here, these last um, couple of slides take visitors through um, the history and sort of the, the spaces, if you like, of the, um, the, the gay party scene in New York City um, in the 1980s. Um, which is organized, especially around um, the Saint, 
um, a, a, a massive nightclub disco um, uh, in, in um, downtown Manhattan. Um, this is a watercolor that depicts a Grace Jones performance at the Saint. Um, but, you know, the history of gay party culture, queer party culture, um, really has Columbus in some ways at its um, center. In the, in the late 70s, an artist named Corbett Reynolds um, founded a nightclub in Franklinton called Rudely Elegant. Some of you may remember it. Um, and this, you know, nightclub attracted a national audience um, with, you know, national performers, Klaus Nomi, Grace Jones, um, Divine, um, also the disco star Sylvester performed at, at Rudely. Um, and so we celebrate this history with a, a, an array of posters for Rudely. Okay, I see that there is a question. And um, Erica um, asks um, about the, um, the length of the exhibition's run, which is an excellent question. Yes, you will be able to see it once the pandemic restrictions are lifted we are working to um, extend it, um, hopefully for a good while. So, um, so don't worry, um, we're, we're on it. And if you don't mind, I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, mark this question answered. Okay. Um, all right, let me just take us quickly through the last bit of the show. Again, this is upstairs. Um, uh, the upper level of the Walter Wing is a different space. It's more open. Um, much higher ceilings. Um, this space, I think, in some ways circles back to the beginning of the show. Um, it's, again, thinking about presence, um, what it is to be out, you know, um, out in the streets, um, but also what it is to, um, you know, de declare one's presence um, as an artist um, and as a queer person. Um, the declarations of presence um, in this part of the show are more personal. Um, this is a, a, a painting um, by Martin Wong, um, a, an artist who was sort of part of the downtown scene in New York City. Um, this is uh, another kind of declaration by Adam Ralston, who was a member of ACT UP. Um, this sticker actually was made um, for, on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of Stonewall, um, uh, so Pride 1989 and was just deployed everywhere in New York City. Um, it was hugely popular with ACT UP people and they all passed it out um, and you know, stuck it up. I am out there for I am a, a Cartesian statement. Um, this is a painting by Barclay Hendricks. Um, Hendricks was not gay, but saw this couple on the street and just thought their, you know, their bond was tender and sensed a vibe and, you know, took a photograph and made a, a gorgeous portrait. Um, another st sort of statement of presence by an artist um, who, uh, who had AIDS at the time. This is Frank Moore. Um, and, you know, although the, the painting, it's called Weed, it doesn't, it's not obvious that this is a self-portrait in any way. There is something kind of animate about the, the painting. Um, you can sort of see that he stuck eyeballs, um, you know, glass eyeballs, not human eyeballs, um, into the into the canvas. And so the painting kind of looks out at you. It it has a presence. Uh, maybe that's the presence of the artist. Maybe it's a different kind of presence. Um, I want to give a little plug here before I finish to a project that can't really be seen. There's it's hard to. Um, it's hard to broadcast it virtually. Um, we commissioned a work for the Columbus um, uh, tour stop, if you like, the, the Columbus version of Art After Stonewall. Um, we commissioned a work from a group of young artists and writers um, based in Columbus. Um, they uh, created this piece called Nocturne um, uh, by interviewing, you know, about 20, 25 different members of um, a really kind of diverse swath of the Columbus queer community, um, intergenerational as well, some um, older members, elder um, members of the community, as well as very young people, um, to try to get people to reflect on the moment that they really felt part of a community um, in, in Columbus. So this is an audio installation um, 
you don't get the full interviews. I mean, it's like many, many, many hours of interviews, um, but the collective um, kind of created little snippets that then play on four um, speakers that hang um, in this space. And so this, you know, again, we're thinking about presence here and what it is to animate a, 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 an art exhibition. And um, the, the commissioned work Nocturne, I think really does that um, just perfectly. Um, as much as this last part of the show thinks about presence, I think it also speaks to some of the unanswered questions that would drive queer you know, theory and politics and culture in the decades after um, 1989. So this is a body of work by a very young um, Lyle Ashton Harris, who was still an undergrad when he made these photographs, which is incredible. Um, both thinking about his own sort of interest in drag culture and ballroom culture, but also thinking about race and sort of the unanswered questions surrounding the, the, the place of um, black queer people in both American society, but also in the, um, you know, the, the struggles around um, queer liberation and, and AIDS um, activism as well. Um, so work by Kuchila Brook, um, which similarly thinks about her own kind of conflicted attempt to navigate lesbian culture and politics um, but here she uses the device of a comic strip. Um, it's, it's a very massive work. Um, it's a sculpture here by Kate Millett, um, feminist writer, so a, a wonderful artist. And then a collection of sort of self-portraits of various kinds. I'm just gonna click through these. We can come back um, hereafter if people have questions. Um, Again, sort of, we're thinking in this part of the show about linking 1969 with 1989 by Felix Gonzalez Torres that um, does that quite literally. This is just right where, I mean, this is like some new in, in Manhattan where uh, I'm, I'm breaking up a little. Okay, I will, I think the only thing that I can do about that is pray. So I will pray that wow internet does not, um, I will pray for the signal. Um, I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm breaking up at all. That's probably a reason for me to finish up quickly though. Um, before I end, um, I just again want to come to the end of the, the show. Um, okay, I'm, I'm told that I'm good now. Um, this is a work by David Wanarowitz that I think for many of us on the curatorial team sort of is the ultimate piece in the exhibition that reflects on the experiences of a child um, battling homophobia and so many other of our society's maladies. The, the show technically does end with a space of reflection um, and with a, an array of works by Corbett Reynolds. Um, remember Corbett is the um, was the founder of Rudely Elegant, but he's also an artist in his own right. And we've collected here, I think 17 of his monumental heads um, from a project in, of 1988. And they look out on the parking lot and on the walk to the museum, as I think a monumental statement of presence as any of us could have thought up. Um, and this is the last work in my show. And it's the last work I think that we placed uh, in the exhibition. Um, it's a poster for the National Coming Out Day by Keith Haring. So that's my, that's my tour. I hope this has, if nothing else, given you an opportunity to um, feel like you're back in the building, um, which is something that so many of us um, in the CMA family just desperately wish we could, um, we could do in person. So thank you all, and I'm, I'm going to switch over to Q&A mode, so I'll, it will still be my head uh, in the video and the slideshow, and uh, let's, let's do this. If you have any questions, please um, type them in the Q&A window, and then we'll work through what we can, and anything that we don't get to, we'll send out um, answers to later. If you all actually have coffee, by the way. Um, it's coffee with the curator. So. 
ですけど。Yes, one as if I could show you one day this kid.、Uh, yeah. Um, or is there a、um, is there a reflection you'd like me to think about with this work? Oh, actually, I'm seeing a couple other questions too.、Um, I'm going to leave this up here in case people want to read through it.、Um, so Raymond asks if there were pieces or artists that we wanted to include that we weren't able to. Yeah, there were.、Um, In a way,、uh, like I, there are I think a couple things that come to mind.、Um, there is a, a another artist collective working in the moment of AIDS activism、um, called Group Material that I think probably should have got larger billing in the show.、Um, but you know, so much of getting Getting a, a checklist kind of locked in has to do with you know what's available to lend at any given moment and how、um, you know how much attention um, lenders um, and artists、um, are able to pay to your exhibition.、Um, and in the case of group material, I think because we had to work with the collective and not just a particular artist, it was hard to kind of lock in. They they、um, create sort of room scale installations,、um, and we kind of knew that we weren't going to be able to recreate an entire group material、um, installation.、Um, I think you know my my thought is more like there are so many things that I'm just like I can't believe we got this in the show. Like I mean, not that not that I like think that we couldn't have done it or that you know whatever, but like.、Um, There were real triumphs, and that's really what sticks with me. You know, the the Harmony Hammond sculpture. It was so not obvious that we were going to get、um, that work lent from the. I think it's from the New Mexico Museum of Art.、Um, it has real condition, what we call condition issues.、Um, uh, the museum was not confident that it was ready to travel. It needed conservation. It needed a very special crate.、Um, and, but on the other hand, Harmony herself, you know, the artist.、Um, here, I'll, I'll show you this work.、Um, let's see if I can go back backwards quickly.、Um, you know, Har Harmony worked with us to pick that particular sculpture. Here it is. So.、Um, You know, we we could have said like harmony. It's this is crazy. There's no way we can get this work shipped out from but not the third. It you know there are just two risks involved, and we like we could have done that, but instead we we did it. <laughs> we、uh, we really did it, and.、Um, That's that's kind of what sticks with me,、um, and I should say we did it. But like, with organizing an exhibition of this scale, like it's such a team effort. And like, in the case of Hammond, I mean, we did it, but really Jennifer, one of the two registrars who worked on the show, like had to kind of improvise a way to get it out of its crate and into the Leslie Lohman Museum in New York. And like, like I, I mean, total props to her. Like, I have no idea. How she did it,、um, and that's the. I, I am very happy to say that there are, are like maybe one or two things that we want we didn't get,、um, which just speaks to I think the quality of the work in the show that it, there are so many things that we did get、um, and are just jubilant about.、Um, other questions. Other questions. Um, and I, I should say I appreciate these、um, thank you notes、um, from Warren and Howard.、Um, thank you for being part of this virtual、uh, tour and audience. I, I really appreciate it. Also, I've lost the chat, so let me try to get that back. 
All Thanks right. Um, any last questions for Danny before we all sign off here? All right. Well, thank you so much, Danny, for doing this. Um, and like I said, all the attendees will be sending a follow-up email. So any feedback you guys have for this would be absolutely great. Thank you. Um, thanks to all of you. And Anagret, I will, um, I'll type an answer into you and um, just because I think we're, we're wrapping up here. But thanks everyone. Just really big thank you. Thanks all.